No, I mean, architecture is political. We gotta, we gotta add that stuff. Indeed. We are tearing down communities to build multifamily and you have to understand we are creating displacement. You're displacing black and brown folks and they don't come back. Half of this podcast would be dedicated to the history of Tyler House, my journey and my discoveries. And hey, I'm going to solve this housing problem. Hey guys, what's up? My name is Melissa Daniels. This is the Architecturalist Political Podcast where black and brown folks talk about architecture. I hope you enjoyed this podcast and be part of my storytelling. I am trying something new and I usually have someone on and then I have them talk about themselves mostly and the projects that they're working on. And I wanted to be more political, get on the political side. And so I'm not comfortable yet carrying a whole show, just talk, me talking. It feels weird to me. I've tried it before and it just felt really weird. So this time around, I've invited someone and I selected two things to talk about. And in this episode, I talked about the MLK, MLK Memorial in Boston called The Embrace, as well as Rihanna's halftime show. I know this both happened earlier this year, like January, February. and But yeah, it was a bit of a delay. And I had opportunity to go to Boston for something else. Actually, I went to Plymouth, Massachusetts, for the vernacular architectural forum. First time I've ever attended. It was fun. I, I enjoyed good people, smart people. I was a bit intimidated because they have a wealth of knowledge. Like they've been studying whatever subjects they are studying in preservation, historical stuff related to architecture. And PhDs is floating around everywhere. So on my way to Plymouth, I stopped by and to experience the embrace. It's in a Boston Common by the movie theater. Yeah, I thought it was be on the side of the state state capitol, but it's not. It's on the other side. Anyway, so my opinions that I stated in the episode was prior to me visiting. And since I visited it, my feelings are still the same, especially me wishing that it was reflective. I kind of wanted to be more like the bean in the sense of reflectiveness, because you could really go in between it and look up. And I just like, oh, I wish I could see myself. I think that would have been more to me that I felt like it would have been more powerful Unfortunately, I had more critique than praise when it comes to the embrace. Kind of like, I wish they did this, this, and this. But I've expressed myself in, in that episode. Everything's based on an article, and I've linked the articles that we mentioned in uh, the show notes, as well as an episode from Scratching Their Surface. There was some, for the embrace, there were two links. One is a Curb article, and then the other one talks about, because like the MIK Memorial was a competition, and they had like five finalists. And on the second, in the second website that I mentioned, I read some of the excerpts, and I butchered some people's names. So I want to apologize ahead of time for that. So during a conversation we are looking at a website and it has various images and we're reading and we're discussing so if you could just click on the website and maybe follow along if possible i hope you could follow along as we're like describing some of these things but i just want you to know that it is a visual conversation because we are looking at websites and we're discussing what we're seeing Another correction I want to uh, mention. So we mentioned Jay-Z and it was an image of his tour, the 444 tour. And he is a photograph of him. He's on stage and he has like 
a little bar thing set up on stage. And I said purple label and purple label. I'm referencing Ace of Spades. That's his champagne. And it shouldn't be purple label. It should be gold bottles. Because that gold bottles are more expensive than the purple one. The purple one is like $600. The gold ones are like, because it's made out of like 14 karat gold or something. That's more expensive. And speaking of Jay-Z, one of the things that we mentioned, again, with Rihanna was the stage that she, the, the halftime show and the floating stage. And Willow Perron, I think that's how you pronounce his last name. Again, apologies. And how he, when you go on his website, it's like, you know, Rihanna, Jay-Z, Kanye, all those celebrities that he has worked with. And that reminds me bringing up to present day of Pharrell. He recently had a fashion show with, because he's the brand ambassador. I don't know the title, but for Louis Vuitton. And I saw some images of it, some of, some of the works and some of the critiques of it, how it's really ready to wear. Like you could just, you could see yourself. So it's not avant-garde in that sense because sometimes you can't wear some of these things because it's so out there. It's only like red carpet ready. But, you know, you can just pull, you can see yourself in some of these, in, in his clothing as well as purchase the bags. And so it was like, you know, Beyonce and Jay-Z was there. Rihanna, of course, was there. Zendaya was there. And other people too, but those are like the top ones. And Law Roach was there. I started thinking about proximities lately, like just and then with the whole submersive thing too, and the billionaires and and how I'm nowhere near that level and top. And I talked about this before. I talked about privilege before. I talked about all this stuff. So it's, it's nothing new if you if you, you listen to me, but I just see like how it all like relates to being poor. <laughs> and this kind of a little, it transcends race. Like it's a class thing, right? Although race does play into this, but it's a class thing right now. And just where architects fall into this, where interior designers fall into this, fashion falls into this like where are we in the spectrum and where we're all workers right we're we're the creative talent until you hit a certain level and now singer songwriter producer is now designing clothes what can't they do you know but is he a seamstress I don't know that'd be interesting but he also has a hotel a friend of mine actually stayed at his hotel in Miami and I took a look at it I can't remember the name of it right now but he of course partnered with somebody and he yeah, like did the interior designs of it and it's nice it's, it's very chic and pink so it's kind of like are they eliminating us or envious of us I don't know I'm thinking more and more about this stuff about where do I fit in in this class and me as a person and me in this industry, like where do I fit in and how do I want to work for them, with them or transcend them? I hope I'm not going too off of a tangent, but yeah, so I just, it's something that I've been thinking about. I want to thank Christina for coming on and talking to me. She is, I I would love to have more of a, a deeper conversation with her in terms of writing. I know we just scratched the surface of it and, you know, just being a, a DC and talk about DC politics. So maybe that's a topic of us talking next. So I hope you enjoyed the episode and here you go. Hi, Christina. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for doing this and talking to me. It's always yep. a, a privilege to, to interact with, with not just you, but just with anybody who agrees to come <laughs> on me in this podcast. 
Oh, can you just tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Who are you? My name is Christina Sturvin Sonny. I'm a wife, a mom of two kids. I have a, my son is about to be 15 on Saturday, which is crazy. Oh, yeah. What? And then I also have a seven month old. So very big gap. Let me see. I'm a journalist. I'm a DC native. I grew up in River Terrace in War 7 off like Benning Road, Minnesota Avenue. I've been freelancing now for maybe like five years. And my whole career as a journalist has been like over a decade. I started around 2012 or so doing like local news journalism. So like the Afro-American newspaper, East City Art, Pink Line Project, a bunch of like small publications. Then I spent two years as a staff writer for DCist from like 2015 to 2017. And then after that, I started freelancing again, writing for like the Washington Post and the Washington City Paper and Washingtonian Magazine and like some national publications like City Lab and Zagat. So I think in total, I've written for maybe like 20 publications throughout my career. Wow. Yeah. And how we met is you were going to write a piece on me mm-hmm. and when we started talking I was like wait a minute because that's not a normal last name that you have like so I thought you were not of Chocolate City origin <laughs> yeah Put it that way definitely DC born and raised yeah <laughs> City. so how did you get into writing about architects and architecture so honestly when you're a freelancer, when you're a freelance writer, you're just like always hustling. So you're always like looking for the next gig because you never know when somebody is going to like be like, oh, no, we don't need freelancers anymore or, you know, something like that. And you're always trying to get more money. So I had a colleague in like the urbanist journalism space and the American Institute of Architects reached out to her to write for them. But she was in grad school at the time. And so she referred them to me and they paid really well. And I was like, yes. And I've never written about architecture before. So it's like one new thing to add to like my portfolio of like topics. So I think I went into it. The first article I wrote was about this like black owned architecture firm, I think based out of, I want to say Atlanta. And it was like a a dad and then his two daughters. I forgot the name of it. A dad and two daughters are like now running it. And like, that was really cool to speak with them about their history and their career and trajectory and all of that. McAfee. Yeah, McAfee. Boom. There it is. Yeah. So they were really cool. I think I think I spoke to both the daughters and the father for that one. And then I did a couple other kind of like feature stories. And then I pitched like a series of... I didn't say Black architects. I probably said like architects of color, like marginalized architects or something like that. But basically, I wanted to talk to a bunch of Black architects and like profile them and do Q&As. So that's kind of how I how I got into it. And I think for me, I'm always writing about like the person and like the human and like their journey. So I don't want that to be confused with the fact that like I wouldn't know anything about architecture, like really. (laughs) I'm just interested in like the person and like what they know and like what their journey is. And like along the way, I learn a little bit about architecture, which is usually, you know, my career anyway. Like I'll interview an artist and I'm really talking about them and their life. And then I just happen to learn, you know, art or food or, you know, whatever like the topic is. How has your interactions with architects been? It's been good. I assume you're talking to me. I mean, compared to other people, it's not curiosity. That's an interesting question. I never really thought. Like, is there a difference at all in like the profession based on like other profession? other professions? Yeah, that you've featured or. I don't think so. I mean, maybe if I think about it like very deeply, but I I think what's similar is like I'm usually always talking to professionals who are like marginalized in their career and like just off the simple fact that like we are not the majority like in the U.S. like most careers like even journalists like one of my big articles in 2018 for Washington City Paper was like the lack of Black D.C. reporters and so it's like most of the people who I interview whether they're like architects or journalists or whomever 
we tend to talk about that. Like, how do you feel being like the only black person, the only Asian person or like Latina person like in this profession? And I mean, I guess I'll say that sometimes in the architecture field, I feel like there might have been a couple of people who were like, you know, it doesn't really impact me, which is different. But for the most part, people are impacted and then they say, you know, how they get around it and how they build community and like all of that. So I think usually I just take the human aspect of everyone. And so architects end up being like human when I talk to them. And and I have a way, I guess, of like having people bring their guard down so they're not like super stuffy and like professional. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. OK, thanks. So I brought you on here because I thought about doing like a little hot topics. The thing about being a, a solo person on a podcast is you're talking to the audience. Mm -hmm. So you're not getting any feedback at all unless they are really passionate and they'll like DM you or something. Or I'll I may get a text message from a friend who listened to that episode. So there really isn't a dialogue. Right. So my thought was to try this out. And I thought that it would be best to talk to like a journalist about it because you have a different, I feel like you guys have a different perspective rather than just talk to other architects. I feel like that other podcasts do that. So it's like just getting out of like the architecture world, the archie speak that tends to happen when you talk about the built environment and especially with Black specific well, they don't even do that. That's the thing, right? This is what I try to do with this podcast, the political part, and to talk about black and brown issues. So I just yeah. thought that maybe let's try this out and see how it goes. I was just curious about like what you thought my answer was going to be or like how you think architects are different from other professions. I always felt like we were different because I feel like there's a persona that we're trying to portray when we're speaking and when we're talking about projects, I feel that we talk to other architects all the time. So we're pitching to other architects. We're trying to, I don't want to say showboat, but just to be on that level of, I like to think of it's BS, like that archie speak, like I mentioned before. Like, mm -hmm. So as I'm curious to hear what other people think when we talk, even though I write one or two articles or whatever. I'm not a journalist. Right. I got to see in English. I may write writer, but mm -hmm. I, in my heart of hearts, I'm not a writer. Like, I feel like I'm not, even though I do. <laughs> I don't know if that's imposter syndrome it. or not, but, but you know, like I'm not you, right? Like you're trained. Whereas I am like, I'm thinking of it as a, a school project, like a, I'm writing a thesis or writing a research paper or something like versus you. I'm assuming there's a technique that you use when you write, like you outline or you like you should outline anyway. But whatever technique that you use, I feel like you're you're better at it than me. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. And like I even though I interview architects, like I don't know Archie speak at all that you would know because like you're trained in that. So yeah, it makes sense. I mean, don't don't people well, the thing is you go for the person. I don't know. Have you done a feature on a building or like have you mm. Now that I can remember, I mean, usually like if I'm talking to a person, I talk about their project. So we end up talking about, you know, what they have done. But even with the National Museum of African-American History and Culture, when it opened, I wrote about the chef for the, the restaurant, the person and his food and stuff. I didn't write about like the building itself. So sometimes it gets in the mix, but usually it's like the person and then what they do and those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just feel that. Yeah, so I was just curious. Because some people, this is their first interaction with an architect. Mm -hmm. And when it's a black or brown architect, I feel like they're more, wow, like I never met, a, you know, an architect A, B, a black one, for example. And if I'm able to educate them saying that, yeah, there's like for to be a black woman architect, it's like 0.2% of the architecture population. Mm -hmm. And for you to meet one, as a black and female in license, that's like winning a lottery. Well, yeah. not really, because the odds are less than, depending on the lottery that you're playing. That makes sense. All right, hot topic. So this hot topic, there's two that I did. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to think of another one that maybe I could send you, and I couldn't think of another one. Um, <laughs> but the first one is The Embrace. Mm -hmm. And what I'm going to do is... 
Okay, so it's a Curb article. Shout out to this writer. I actually reached out to this writer. Mm-hmm. And it was just a DM, too. Like, I'm really not. And she could, this person like could Twitter. be. Yeah, on Twitter. The article is Curb. is January 20th, 2023. And the title is The Problem with Boston's MLK Memorial Isn't That It Looks Like a P Word. And she did a really good job in like telling the story of it. Yeah. Which I thought that it was good. So let me get my impressions on it first before I ask for you. So I try to get a look at it on all angles. Obviously, I'm not in Boston. I went to school there. So I I know where this is Mm -hmm. in relationship to the city. So I was just trying to my first thing was to take a look at it from all angles. Yeah. And it's kind of hard to do when you're not there. So these are renderings or approaches that I don't know if you are able to see when you walk around it or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I didn't get it. And what I mean by that is because it's off of a photograph. Right. And I appreciate the person who did this. So it looks like it was from, oh, it came up. Oh, Paul English, who was a co-founder of kayak.com. And he had the original idea to do a memorial in Boston. Yeah, right. He was able to raise funds and to get this established. My opinion is, I don't get it. I don't see the correlation of it being a MLK memorial and people are not all people are familiar with that photograph that it was that it was referenced. So what what did, what was your overall impression? Yeah, I think I learned about it. I have a group chat with my brother and my cousin. We just talk about random things and I think they brought it up and they were like, "Hey, did y'all see that MLK statue?" And I'm like, "No." So then I think when when they sent the photo, it was a photo of the statue and then the the original photo of Dr. King and his wife, you know, side by side. So I'm like, OK, I get it. But like, I only got it because I saw it right next to the inspiration. So I did wonder, like, not that this is like a simple fix, but is the photo even there, like on site? Like maybe if they would have had a photo, the right. original photo blown up and then you can easily see like oh okay this is what it is but I don't even think it's there I feel like that could have been kind of like a very simple fix even though it's like more complicated than that but yeah just looking like the angle that you have now like it definitely looks like you know more explicit things that people have been talking about so yeah, I don't, I don't think they did a good job. And then one thing that the author of the Curb article said was, so she was like, it's designed so visitors can walk around and through it. So it probably doesn't feel as graphic in person as it does in photographs. But because public art today exists online as much as it does in the physical world, they should have thought about that more, like how it would look online and photos on like memes and like all of that stuff. I don't think that was taken into consideration. They were just thinking about people who are actually like standing there, like how they would receive it, but we don't live in that world anymore. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your view. What struck me though, and I'm connecting the this article to, she provided a link to the proposals mm-hmm. of it. And I thought this was just, I want to say that there were some that I thought should have should have gotten it everyone the empty pulpit monument well i mean i yeah no not this one but I'm, and i'm just cycling through it so the first one yeah like you mentioned the empty pulpit a monument and this is by barbara chase rebound i think that's her mm-hmm. as I pronounce her last hyphen name with michael rosenfield gallery i i didn't get the it looks like bells. Is that what it is? Yeah, I don't. That wasn't my favorite. Yeah, that wasn't my favorite either. I think it was too maybe abstract. And that's another question 
she had in the article. And I, and I wonder for you, like, as a person in the field, memorials, do you think we should not stick with, but like, do you prefer like the classical monument of an actual person, like their face, their image, their body versus, you know, anything else? <sighs> That's a good question. <clears throat> and I think some artists have have done a great job in translating what they interpret to be to the audience. And what, what architects do basically is hire artists, something like this, or I mean, some do do it themselves, but in this case, for this particular competition, I'm the architect partnered with an artist. Mm -hmm. So the second one here, King's Boston King's Memorial by David Jane and Adam Pingleton with Future Pace. People understand this, right? So what it is 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 more of a landscape type memorial, something that you experience instead of watching. So there's a journey with it. So you have like a bridge and then you just walk around the landscape with these stone seating angled in sidewalks coming out of the ground mm -hmm. or coming out of the landscape. I actually appreciate stuff like this. Then you just go look at something, walk around it and then leave. Because when you're going through a, a path or a journey, you're reflecting, right? At first you, you, you enter and then there's an establishment that I am entering a space. And then as you walk through it, you get to read, you slow down your pace. Sometimes you have kids, kids will just run through it. But if you keep going again and again, you may miss something that, that you didn't see before. Yeah. Versus like a sculpture or something, you walk around it. Yeah, I like the fact that you can get it through different angles, which is something that the first, the empty pulpit memorial didn't have. So you kind of just look at it up and down. It's there. It's kind of like a a paperweight almost, right? Like, you know, it's there. You can always go and visit it. But there's only so many angles that you can look at versus, again, with a landscape like this, you can go here multiple times. You can have right. lunch if you're local. It's a place where you can, you know, kids can run around. You could actually, and I'll just look at the other one from different point of view. So yeah, like here, people are sitting and walking. And so yeah, you 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 experience this. So mm -hmm. what what are your thoughts? Yeah, I definitely agree. I, I like anything, especially outdoors, that I can just like sit and maybe have like a little picnic or maybe work on my laptop or just like and be in the presence of, you know, something symbolic, you know, glean from the spirit of King, like while I'm maybe like having lunch with somebody or or doing something else, or just like meditating, like in the space or, you know, experiencing it in a different way. So like anytime there's seating also, cause I'm lazy, like, I just want to <laughs> out, right. So like anytime there's like seating or like a water feature or something like that, I'm, I'm drawn to it. The only thing I didn't like about this one was that like the main color is black. Like it, I don't know. It's just very dark. And then like some of them, I don't know. I like the the marble or like the bronze mm. or the mosaic, you know, I just wish it like shimmered a little more oh, I like the idea nice. of it and the experience, but I just wanted to like pop a little more. Mm -hmm. So the next one is of course the embrace. Mm -hmm. And this is from Hank Willis Thomas, along with mass design group. So what I understand you have the sculpture itself and then there's a plaza that I believe Mass has Mass did. Looking at it with the competition submission, I wish it was gold. Mm -hmm. And this is more of a morph, mm -hmm. right? Like you it's more sculpture and less figurative. Because I feel like what we got was literally arms. Right. Yeah. Brown body. Arms. Yeah. Versus a mold. 
That's a good point. I didn't notice that, like, the difference in what it actually turned out to be versus the rendering. Yeah. And I wish they kept it. Oh, There's only two images. But another interesting thing is that they changed it. Oh, because it's black on the... It's black, and it's more of a circular. Mm -hmm. And they have these lines going through it. It looks like they still kept the diamond shaped. It's darker. It's and then darker. also... I don't know if like the weather at the, I mean, it was January. So even like the grass, like in real life looks like non-existent. So it just looks like drab. I, I think life. they, I think they didn't even, well, huh. You know, like in the rendering, it's like, oh, and it's like grass around it's green. But like in the photo, it's just like a construction site. Yeah. But they don't even have grass in between it. Yeah, they don't. And even the grass around it is like more dirt. Yeah, grass. look at this. Like they have seating around it. I didn't even notice that was seating. Is there seating in real life? Oh, they just I didn't even to... got the New York Times. Wow. Do you know how often a rendering transforms, you know, when it's actually completed? Like how often does it act do memorials and you know statues stay true to what was proposed? I can't specifically talk about that, but just in general, what happened was it got value engineered out or they just changed their minds. This could have been really costly for them to do, especially maintaining this green space in between. They probably would have had to use turf in lieu of grass, or maybe they had to co confine the, sp the space could have got a bunch of reasons why this yeah. rendering did not look like but i've seen renderings that look exactly like real life like you could literally put it up and it's exactly what it is but usually what happens is it gets get vd'd out or the client just changes their minds mm -hmm. or it changes hands or it could be a bunch of reasons why but i kind of wish though that they kept it more sculptural than I agree. Figuratively. The next is the ripple effect with Disco Bonner and Marianne Thomas Architects. Okay. This is massive. Yeah, the second the first thing when I saw it, I was like, it just seems too busy. It's it, a lot. it is a lot going on here. It is a lot going on here. So basically the landscape is a bunch of circles, really. Mm -hmm. And then they have these towers. Let me actually read it. Cambridge-based artist and professor. Ooh. His first you... name. <laughs> or their first name. Priestoff with Disco and architect and professor Julian Bonner explores issues of social memory. And their proposal calls for a large space with two beacon towers equipped with bell with special bell sounds and pulses of light monitoring. What does that mean? The On the ground surrounding the towers are ripples of light that reflects the impact of the king's words and activism. Across from the beacons is a mound with an amphitheater and a seating area for the public, plus a large bridge leading to the Robert Gown Shaw in the 54th Regiment Memorial across the common. Below the bridge, a glass wall offers a more intimate and self-reflective encounter with written and spoken texts that teach and inspire, according to the proposal. Yeah. Two beacon towers equipped with special bell sounds. Yeah, I, I didn't get that. And pulses of light monitoring. I, yeah, I didn't get that one. Yeah, when when I read it, I was like, it seems like something you have to experience. Like, I don't know if they're doing this now. I was watching, I don't know if you watch Million Dollar Listing, but I love that theory. <laughs> and so on Million Dollar Listing LA, they went to this site in Vegas and it was just like an open site. Like nothing was there, it was just like all dirt. And they had to like sell it, but then they had like these VR machines. And so people will put on the headset and then they can kind of see like how the house is going to be. Like, I feel like this needed that. Like, mm -hmm. I would have, instead of just like a 
rendering and like a, descri- a written description, like I would have to put on some headphones and like hear the bells that they're talking about or something. Cause the way they're describing it, it just doesn't make sense. Avenue of Peace. Yinka Shonaver's proposal examines race and class through painting, sculpture, photography, and film, often questioning cultural and national definitions. He proposes a memorial walkway, sculpture, and water feature. The walkway would be lined with a series of 22 inscribed benches where people can sit and learn about the kings. The center of the walkway will hold a 30-foot-high fountain covered in colorful mosaic on top of an oval pool lined with black granite. The fountain's mosaic, which incorporates the king's name, is meant to shimmer in the pool below. Visitors will also be able to download the mobile app through which they could watch and listen to accounts on some of the key moments of king's life what are your first thoughts i felt like it's not really thought out Mm -hmm. and the colors don't really make any sense Mm -hmm. he's he's using bright colors so at the bottom is a array of blues from navy blue to sky blue in checkered patterns and then up top he's going for a orange like a lighter palette of orange and again some blues I I don't get it I don't get it at all when I first saw it I was like that could be pretty I mean it's like I think it's the brightest or like one of the brightest but it also gives me it doesn't like when I look at it I'm like oh Dr. King and it also gives me like church vibes like like church window vibes maybe it's like Catholic churches that's what it's giving me right now so I think it, yeah, it does. Bad. I just don't think it works for this. Yeah, yeah. It's too abstract and could be anything. Right. Only thing that makes this different is has Martha Luther King Jr. on it. Mm-hmm. Other than that, yeah, I don't really see. So let's try this. Out of the five finalists, which one do you like the most? Uh, let me see. Yeah, the first one. This is kind of growing on me, though. Yeah, like when you zoomed in, it is. Let me see. I don't like the hills, though. I think if you did more with the landscape. Yeah. And this could be like the final destination. Yeah, I think empty pulpit monument. If this was the actual monument and there was more like seating and landscaping and like, you know, experiential elements around it i think this would be my top pick okay it's the second one this is with david and adam and david is the guy who did the national museum of african-american history and culture right so he's like pretty huge i really like this one does it even have like a central like a focal point though i don't think so let me you know i didn't read the the excerpt for for that one, I kind of kind of looks like a park. It. It's fine, but I wanted to have like a statue or monument. Maybe I'm old school, but all right. Here's the excerpt. David Jane has been described as an architect, and I know I butchered his last name. I do apologize. Has been described as an architect with an artistic sensibility. His biggest project is the $540 million National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. Artist and Adam Pingleton is perhaps one of the most well-known contemporary and conceptual artists creating work that explores social justice movements. His conceptual practice, which encompasses painting, sculptures, writing, films, and performance, integrates writing by Malcolm X, John Asbury, and Gertrude Stein, among others. Their proposal is also inspired by the idea of a mountaintop, which King Jr. mentioned in his last speech. Quote, delivered in support of striking sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee. This speech is driven by a spatial metaphor, the mountaintop, 
the point of view of the struggle from which one can see the history of past struggles as well as the future community to come, end quote. The proposal reads, Pendleton and Ajene's plan would build a wise, open structure of black stone that has served as a platform and amphitheater for residents to look onto the common and the city. On the lawn surrounding the raised sculpture, the plan calls for slope stone sculptures engraved with the words of Coretta Scott King and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. serving as public seating. I guess this really encompasses what MLK is about. And I say that because you can hold protest here. You can hold, although there really isn't a, well, I, I, I want to say there is a, a focal point. Like, Is the bridge supposed to be the main thing? Well, it's like, it's it's in the shape of a triangle, right? And you're looking down towards something. So even though there's no platform for someone to perform, maybe if it was more thought out, like if they won, they probably would have done something like that, right? I also like the f- fact that it's a confined space. Like it doesn't look that huge. Yeah. It looks it looks manageable, you know? Like it looks, it doesn't take away and then the fact that they incorporated like the state house so this is but it is some type of institution and they made it like this grand stair and you cross over the the street here and it's kind of like it's a I feel like it's a gesture of how government is and they walk in and you see your people yeah I like it also, I'm seeing more from the second. Which was photo? This here? one or this one? The not that one. This one. Yeah, more of like the mountaintop aspect because I'm yeah it's all level to me. But now I see how the bridge is really like on top, and then like the traffic is below. Because I'm like, how high are you really? Like, is it a mountaintop? But I guess it it is elevated enough that it is. So I see that symbolism. So it makes more more sense now. Okay, and this is what we've been talking about. So. The thing about the the embrace, though, that I read is like he was trying to show two things. Like one is like the love, you know, of the embrace, but also like locking arms. And I feel like it would have been cool to have maybe a like some type of like statue of like King and then like multiple people like locking arms in like a protest. And like that could symbolize the locking arms, not like this hug from the photo. Mm -hmm. I think that would have been cool. Let me just read their submission. It's very short. Well, I mean, this might not be the official one, but... It is short. Hank Willis Thomas, who is working with Mass Design Group, inspired by the idea that protest offers a sense of togetherness, both physically and spiritually, quote, on multiple occasions, and the nation witnessed the kings locked together at the front lines of a march. A monument that captures his embrace declares that love is the ultimate weapon against injustice. End quote. Willis Thomas proposal states. Willis Thomas and Mass Design Group propose a 22-foot high sculpture of the arms of the couple embracing each other and thus also enveloping visitors below them. Participants will be simultaneously vulnerable and protected, reads the proposal. Yeah, I think it's a slight difference between locking arms in like protests and like hugging and embracing. Mm-hmm. And we talked about this in length, the the last two. So so out of them, out of the five, which one you like? I would go for Empty pulpit from Barbara Chase and Michael Rosen filled with slight alterations. At first, I didn't like it, but now I see it. Mm-hmm. Now I kind of see it. Especially after reading the explanation. Did I yeah. read this? Yeah, I read this. 
No, I didn't read this. Did I read this? I think you did, because I remember Michael Max and Mary Anderson. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So the next one, and screen share for a second. So the second thing I want to talk about, and last thing I want to talk about, is Rihanna's halftime show. Mm-hmm. That was in February. That was a long <laughs> time ago. And I think the reason why I want to talk about this is two things. One is the design, the overall design of it, the floating platforms, structure, you know, like you, how in the world do you float 10 stories high and not die? Right. And then the, and then, you know, the other thing too is the outfits. Mm -hmm. So overall, I'll share my screen again. Well, what do you think? I mean, I really liked it when I first saw it. I was like, wow, is she floating? Like, that's crazy. And I'm just like wondering like how wide the platform is. And then I also read that she's afraid of heights. So kudos to her on that. And then as we found out, you know, she's pregnant. So she wasn't moving around a lot, but like, which makes sense. But also, even if she wasn't pregnant, she was floating in the air like that. Like, I, I wouldn't be moving around a lot. I like how kind of like dark and like starry the environment is and then yeah like their outfits like the red and the white how they really just like pop so that's cool and then another thing I read was how during like the umbrella song like the platforms like formed an umbrella if you're looking at it from like a bird's eye view which is cool like they moved around a lot but like during that one song they were able to form an umbrella so I thought I thought it was really cool and thoughtful it wasn't over the top it was simplistic but oftentimes the most things the things that look the most simple are the most complex to build so I really liked it I felt it was kind of hard to believe that you know all the white people in white were sperms (laughs) and she was the egg (laughs) <laughs> I didn't get into much of all of that. Like, did she come out and say that eventually, or is that what people? I don't mean? know. I didn't. I didn't bother to to dig too deep into that. But I was just like, oh, okay, that's cool. Like, it. I didn't. I didn't. You know, I. That's a way to announce your pregnancy, in a visual way. Yeah. <laughs> you know. So the person who designed this. And apparently he is a celebrity artist, designer. I say designer, designer. And there's this other podcast and they did an interview with him. And I was fascinated about this guy. Like he, he, he's a pure artist, right? Like he doesn't do interviews. He doesn't, he, he stays back and he's like, He's not saying, hey, look at me. I know all these celebrities. I'm famous too. He's more like, let me do my work. I'm like a craftsman. I think he's one of those people who I have a friend who always says like, he wants to be like famous in his like career and his industry. But like if he's walking down the street, he wants to be able to walk down the street. You know, he doesn't want to be like famous to the public, but as long as he's well-respected, by his people and like what he does and like that's good enough he seems like one of those people and that's what architects are i feel like that's what they strive to be is that they want to sit back and just be architects and let the work speak for themselves okay so what's on the screen right now is i i went and clicked on his website and mm-hmm. i did not say his name yet because as always, I can't read and I need to... Perlin? Perron? Perron? Yeah, Perron. Perron. Is Perron his first name or last name? I think, it's, I think his first name might be Will, maybe. Why wouldn't Willow. Say... Willow? Oh, yeah, Willow, unless that's a typo. Shouldn't be a typo. It shouldn't be a typo. You're right. <laughs> You never know. Willow. Yeah, it's Willow Perron. Yeah. Okay. Willow Perron. So that's who I'm talking about. So I'm on I'm on his website and they're prints. Like so he does cover art or maybe he creates the entire book. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know that was a thing. But yeah, yeah, he crafted the layout. It's like a fashion style street book. 
Street style. Is that its album cover? I guess so. Jay Z's album cover. Twenty thirteen. Hmm. That was a decade ago. That was a decade ago. Holy Grail, Magna Carta. I wonder. I wonder, like the trajectory of his career. Like, was he doing print and like? design and things like that and like at what point did he get to stage design and building and all of that did they talk about that on the podcast it wasn't i can't remember i remember them talking about him being who he is why he's that way Mm -hmm. they may have went into some of his work but i wasn't versed in his work Mm-hmm. So I can't remember. So I will link the podcast in here so people who are interested can listen to it. But I feel like Willow is what architects should be. But let me add to that. He has the Black artists, right? Like he, he Jay-Z, Rihanna, Kanye, right. all those. His work is phenomenal. I just wish Black artists who go to Black people. Because I feel that there are some Black artists that can do this level of work. Yeah, yeah. That has this level of vision. Mm -hmm. Right? So, Super Bowl. And I was listening to this TikTok who broke down the structure of this. Broke it down in like 60 seconds or less. But it was just fascinating. Like, this is like a structure to me it was like a structural genius like Uh how do you you have this live okay so the thing about structure is you have dead load and you have live load right so a building is dead load and people walking around is the live load so dead load means like columns or the floor slab or like 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 stuff that's there that's not going to move right and then you have this transient stuff furniture moves we move that sort of thing and so structure engineers would calculate this right like they would like okay there's 150 people that's that's 150 bodies times like the average weight you know they they have charts for this stuff so when it comes to her floating you also have to kind of like wind right the whatever structure that's holding that has some type of movement all this like Mm -hmm. variable movement and then even like i'm scrolling back up these dancers are dancing Right. So there's lateral movement on the structure. How do you keep that still and not freak somebody out that they're like on a slip and slide or something? Mm-hmm. So to me, that's just a marvel in itself that I hope there's some film being produced to explain how the hell they came up with this. Yeah, but- I think one article that was like a breakdown I didn't like read all the way through it and I read that it took five or six months from the idea to completion for the stage designer I believe you yeah I think the five to six months is in the complex article okay you sent me but then I'll find the other link to the actual visuals of the stage design how does this inspire you like how both embrace and you know, the Rihanna, like how do these topics inspire you and your work? That's a good question. For this one, Rihanna, what her her set was simple. And it's almost, it was too simple. But mm-hmm. if you keep thinking about it and keep looking at it, you see the complexity of it. I think with the embrace, you don't see the complexity. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the frustrating part. Like, and I think because somebody's looking, you, you see something that's simple, right? And I think when people look at it, they're not to say that they're simple minded, but you do see a sexual thing right? In, instead of the intent. So when you look at Rihanna's set, you see the color, right? So she's the center, she's the red, and you see all this white. And then you see these platforms raising up and down and they're they're dancing and stuff. So that's simple. There's Mm -hmm. no pyrotechnic. There's no, they have a set. This is a set. And by set, I mean like there's a band in in the back and you dance and you talk. Just like, you know, this 44 tour of Jay-Z, you know, like it's a set. But if you look into the the complexities of it, like I let me scroll back up. He has his 
purple label, right? Like on set and like it's ready to be poured and to right. celebrate with him. But, you know, it's something that you will only see if you're up close or you have or you're you're on the balcony like this guy who's taking the photograph. But if you wait in the back, you won't see it. But it's like details like that, you know, that you kind of just appreciate. And I think that he embrace, I don't really see that. And it's kind of frustrating that it missed its mark. And in yeah. terms of who did it, right? Here you have a, a Black artist who did the embrace. And here you have this white guy who has a stronghold on Rihanna, Jay-Z, and all the other celebrities. But it's not a bad stronghold, Mm -hmm. right because he does great work and so does the black artist like i saw some of his other work and it's phenomenal they're both about us right mark luther king as well as rihanna Mm because she's also a national treasure how does that reflect on us do you think from the outset like for the competition for mlk should they have just been like we are looking for black artists to design this or like artists of and and I kind of wonder what you think about like black versus people of color, but that could also be another conversation. But I wonder from the beginning, should they have just targeted just us and like that's it? That won't happen. Why do you think not? Well, the person who has the money of oh, yeah, the controls white the team. power. Yeah. And he won't do that. Why would he do that? Mm-hmm. Why would they do that? Like why? I mean, if he's truly trying to honor King in Black culture, he should. But yes, why would he? No yeah. shade to him. I have no idea who he is. Mm-hmm. It's just, that's a deeper thing. That's the Chocolate City t-shirt you're wearing. That's right. that's it. So yeah. How did you feel about the Hot Topics? I kinda, we, we, we were kind of... I like them. They made me think more, you know, thanks for sending the the background info because I'm not up on hot topics these days with a seven month old but it was good to you know get into things and just like really like think because it makes me think about my my writing a lot like the last thing I'll say is like I don't like I have this thing about my writing where I feel like it should be more so I have a friend who I tell her she writes flowery and she hates that because she she was like that just sounds like fluff but I'm like no I like it it's like really poetic and like all this stuff and like I don't write like that And my husband is like, my superpower with writing is just breaking down these like super complicated topics and making them easy to digest for, you know, the everyday person. And so when you think about like the Rihanna, the the layout and everything, and it's like, oh, it's super simple. But like I can write, I was just writing this article about Black maternal mortality. And it was like 4,000 words, which is like way longer than what I normally write. But like every paragraph, it seemed like I spent... 45 minutes to an hour on like three sentences just because I'm doing like all this research and then all this fact checking and like all this stuff because I want it to be perfect so like when you read the paragraph it looks super simple like oh okay this happened whatever but like all the time that it took me (laughs) to like get this paragraph down it's just like a lot so yeah it it just I, I like writing about like other topics like art and food and culture and you know architecture and all that stuff and then like seeing how it applies to like what I do as as a writer and like thinking through these things with other people it's just like a really good process to help like evolve and like grow in my my career and my craft so I appreciate it I didn't know that you're treating writing like an art definitely yeah but like like a craft it depends on what it is like if I if I'm writing breaking news for like something I need to like pop it out real quick, then it's just like, all right, whatever, let me just do it. But if it's something I care about, like black paternal mortality, I'm gonna make sure, especially because I'm writing it for like a, a white run publication, I'm gonna make sure I dot all my I's, cross all my T's, like give all the context, like do everything, make sure like the layout and the style, like I, I'm putting a lot of work into it. Mm. So yeah, it depends on what I'm writing, but it, it really is a craft and I'm I'm reading books and like still learning like how to merge like the basic you know mechanics of writing with like similes and metaphors and like details and and all that so so it's fun wow you just blew my mind (laughs) thank you i'm serious because you just like i feel that putting words together 
to paint a picture mentally, Mm -hmm. it's so beautiful. Like it's so, like it, it blows my mind and, you know, a lot of things blow my mind, but that really, it blows my mind because it takes me forever to do. And then you, you don't know what people are interpreting your work as. Right. That's the tough part. Once you put it out there in the world, it's no longer yours. You just yeah. got to accept that. Same thing with buildings. Once you put yep. it out there, you walk away from it. Mm-hmm. And it may be there 30 years later. And then you like, you go back and you look at it and you're like, ugh. So why did I do this? Why did I do that? I look at my writing from years ago and I'm like, oh, this was terrible. (laughs) You're like, look at this color palette. Why did I pick brick? Like, yeah, like exactly. Well, Christina, thank you so much for coming on. Of course. Thank you for having me. All right. Have a good one. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in to Architecture's Political Podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it informative or at least entertaining. If you like what you heard, please share with others. You can also connect with Arcus Polly on social media, currently on Instagram, as well as Facebook and Twitter. If for more information, visit us on our website. It's arcuspoly.online, A-R-C-H-I-P-O-L-L-Y.online. I also want to thank our loyal supporters who have been with this podcast for at least three years. It means the world to me, and I'm totally grateful to have you part of this community. I will try to bring you the best content as possible, and I can't wait to share more amazing episodes with you. If this is your first time listening or just like a particular episode or all of them, you can support this podcast by going on glow.fm slash arcuspoly. Again, thank you for your support. It means the world to me. And thank you so much for listening.